back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. We got a lot to go over, a lot of news. We didn't cover some news last week because we were just enthralled with the Loki season finale, um, and we were just focused on that, um, and we promised we would get around to the news because there was a lot of news, a lot of interesting news that came out last week, and a bunch has come out this week. Brian, how are you doing? Yeah, it's hard to keep up with both the content and the news. Um, but I think the other thing, too, is it felt like we had a little bit of a lull in, on the DC side of things. And that really feels like it kind of ramped way back oh, up. Definitely. Let's get let's get into it right now. Um, first up, Brian, it seems to me that people or a person, I don't know what, has something against Matt Reeves Batman. They, they want to put out these rumors about Matt Reeves and Pattinson not getting along, Pattinson, Pattinson getting into some extracurricular activities with other actors or actresses or whatever. And it seems like there's people out there hating on the film and want, I don't know if they don't want it to succeed, but apparently there's a rumor that Matt Reeves and Pattinson don't want to work with each other. And it's just a rumor. And based on where it came from, um, which I'm pretty sure most of you know that we got this coverage, it's not a reputable one, but then Cineblend um, put this article out as well. Is th At this point, Brian, we can't say that this sort of tension doesn't really exist. Right, we we have to sort of assume that there may be something um, between them in terms of them not really getting along, but will do whatever needs to be done in order to make these films. Because this can't be, if we expect the Batman to be what it will be, we can't expect this one to be the first and the last of what we were expecting to be a trilogy. What are your thoughts? Um, well, first off, I suspect the Joker. This seems like the kind of thing the Joker <laughs> would put into the ether to, to turn the public against Batman. I mean, the, the, the kinds of rumors that have been put out there about this almost defy the imagination. I mean, usually you hear tensions, you hear someone's being a diva for a couple of days, or, you know, every once in a while you get the the Christian Bale audio or the Tom Cruise audio of someone going off on set. Right. And that's yeah. real. That's not contrived, but like the stuff in here is like, you know, supermarket tabloid stuff. Right. It's, it's like, like every month though, once a month they, they, you, you get one of these, but it's, it, it's like, I don't even want to put it in our content just because I almost feel like we're, we're doing it too much service to actually like detail it, but just Google it. And the stuff that'll come up is like, Stuff you've never heard of yeah, yeah. on a set. I still have a tough time putting stock in it. I mean, I feel like... I, I guess I just go back to, like, we know Pattinson signed a deal with Warner Brothers, a first look deal with Warner Brothers, after he went through this process, right? So he did Tenet. True that. Heard nothing bad about him on the Tenet set. Now, granted, Chris Nolan usually viewed as one of the easier filmmakers to work with. I've never heard anyone say they had a bad time working with him. But he does that for Warner Brothers. He does this for Warner Brothers and then signs a deal with a first look deal with the same studio. I just, if he had the kind of experience as being described, I don't care if he said, well, I don't have to work with Matt Reeves again. I could just work with Warner Brothers. Why would you go back to that? I don't yeah. really get it. Especially because Matt Reeves has done a lot of good work, obviously, in, in, in the genre. And he's not done at Warner Brothers because he's got the TV show, right? Got the yeah. TV show. It doesn't add up to me. Now, I'm, I mean, I guess we had this thing about like Matt Reeves is known, I guess, as one of these sort of multi, like lots of takes directors. That was one of the things that came out. I might buy that. I mean, that mm -hmm. apparently is sort of part of his process. Mm -hmm. But again, you would know that before the camera started rolling. Like, Actors don't show up blind to productions. They no. know who they're working with. Now, that's not to say that it's never blown up in history. Obviously, it has. We have seen some of these things go down. But 
this one I just have a tough time. I'm kind of with you. It kind of feels like either somebody didn't get a part or somebody has just an ax to grind on a personal level with one of the individuals and just kind of wants to, you know, put some put some slime on this production until until we see it. Or Zack Snyder fans. I mean, even if... <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I guess my answer to that would be like, and we'll talk about it later. This is a studio that seems quite content to have more than one version of the same character. So why, yeah. why are you, why are you tearing down one version of Batman to, you know? I mean, I guess you wanted the Affleck version, and Affleck's in the, you know, he's in another movie. He is in the Flash movie, yeah. so never say never on on comebacks, I guess. But I don't know. It just doesn't seem like one of those things that that um, I'm gonna view as a reason to doubt this film yeah. um, until it's like up on the screen and hitting us in the face that there's some sort of conflict evident in the performance we're getting. I don't know, what What are you thinking? I mean, you, you've seen a lot of these rumors come through. I, I, what, what do you think when you see some of this stuff? I, I Listen, it's been, it's always revolved around Pattinson and mostly around Pattinson. First, you got the the, the the news, oh, he's not working now, he doesn't want to work out, and then he's doing some other stuff, um, and then he's not getting along with Matt Reeves. This is not the first time they talk about Matt, him and Matt Reeves not getting along. Um, and then you get some, some article written about Warner Brothers don't like um, what they're seeing, because they've seen, uh, apparently they've seen some, some footage of it, and they don't, it's just, well, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> we should probably view that as a good sign. <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. If they don't like it, it must we be, be great. raising our box office. <laughs> Two billion dollars. Listen, I, I think with regards to the quality of film that we're going to get, I don't think we have anything to worry about. Could there be some tension between Pat Pattinson and Matt Reeves, you know, because of how Matt, Re Matt Reeves work and it could be possibly frustrating if you're doing more takes and takes and takes. But if you're not getting the performance that you want, then you're going to keep pushing, right? So it is what it is. I don't think it'll affect, I'm hoping it doesn't affect the the, the continuation of, of this first movie into the second and third ones. And there could be some truth to it, but at the end of the day, I just want to see the film. The the, the behind the scenes stuff, but really doesn't, with with regards to that stuff, really doesn't matter to me. So, it is what it is. What do you I guys think? think? Well, go ahead. I think also, I just want to put out there. I also think like, when I, you know, what they're going for. I think there's also there's an there's a natural intensity to what he's trying to do. So if you're Pattinson and you're going to immerse yourself in the kind of Bruce Wayne we think we're going to get mm -hmm. that's probably going to take you to a pretty dark place I mean I think if you're especially if you have some method you know to your acting I mean, yeah. that's you're going to try to really embody that character for the duration of the shoot and this is a shoot that has been really long because of COVID um, Pattinson himself getting COVID you've had multiple shutdowns so you know don't underestimate the human factor of like you sign up to play this part you thought you were going to do it for three months and you're doing it for a year just to get it up on screen like you know that could be also part of it as well yeah. um and then you know i think from the studio perspective my sense is this is very much like a genre film like at least that's what the teaser threw mm. at us was mm. like you are looking at you know thriller dark like really like really has a mood to it you know, I could see a studio being like, well, you know, can we sell as much toys off this? No, probably not. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the way the way they're portraying the Riddler, I don't know if kids want to buy a Riddler <laughs> toy that looks like it. But, you know, like that's not that's but that's not what the mandate was. And that's not what Matt Reeves vision of this was. So I don't know. I, I, like I said, I'm still I'm still bullish. I think, you know, this feels also like one of those things where if the next trailer builds on the teaser, like whatever we get at Fandom. All this stuff kind of goes away. Goes away. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Give me this movie now. Yeah. yeah. All you gotta do is watch the trailer, and all that other stuff is gonna go away. Watch the current trailer, and you'll be fine with what you think is happening, and and you don't really care about that stuff. Let us know what you think in the comment section below. Is do you think there's real tension in there? It may be. There may be some tension, but it really doesn't matter. All I want to see is a good film. 
Uh, next up, Colin Farrell gives us a little bit of an insight in, as to his character, how many times he's in some scenes. He says he's a, he's in about what, like four to five nine scenes? Four or five nine scenes, minutes. Nine minutes. So think about this for a second. He's in this he's in this amazing um, makeup costume, and he looks unrecognizable. He's looking forward to seeing um, what he looks like in this film, and he's looking forward to seeing this film. Period. I'm quite certain that he will pop up in the second or third. Of, of this trilogy that we hope to get. So it is, uh, they're definitely building something from this film. What are your thoughts on, on, on Colin Farrell just showing up in a few films? Is this it for him? Or do you think there's other um, um, appearances that he'll make in a second or third film if they do that? Well, first of all, I mean, I've heard other interviews with Colin Farrell. He usually is not afraid to speak his mind. If this production was as much of a disaster as everyone's saying, I kind of feel like he would have might have hinted at it. He said nothing. He sounds pretty positive. And in fact, I yeah. know he's part of the reshoots as well. Yeah, no, this is perfect. I mean, I think I think what Matt Reeves has talked about is this sort of noir world and this sort of de you know, young detective in the middle of it. And we we're basically going to get a little appetizer with a lot of the rogues from the rogues gallery but you know you're, you're not he, the, the riddler's the feature villain as far as we know and even he doesn't even dano i don't know how much actual screen time he's going to get because it's more like he's orchestrating exactly you know these killings that they're trying to solve so i think it's perfect i mean you think about like nine minutes five scenes Farrell looks great in the sense that he doesn't at all look like colin Farrell, and <laughs> it looks like a, the penguin is a very tough real world character Right. I mean, in some ways, what Tim Burton did with Danny DeVito was like the more logical solution is to like make it as silly as possible because yeah. it is kind of a silly idea. Yeah. But but Colin Farrell's sort of gangster ish look, I think, is was really well thought out. And so I'm excited to see what his nine minutes are. And you're right. I don't even know if it's necessarily the second movie where he's the feature villain, but we yeah. know at some point he will get his shine. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think I think it's I think it's the perfect way to use these supporting characters. Yeah, man, I'm looking forward to seeing the penguin. When I saw the penguin, I was like, I didn't know who that was. And when I found oh. out it was Colin Farrell, I was like, oh snap! I was listen. There's just too many pluses on this film for me to feel concerned about what we're going to be seeing. Let me ask you a quick question. Mm -hmm. Assuming this is a an excellent debut, which we hope it is, and which means we're going to get sequels. How many sequels are you okay with without having the Joker? Because of Batman's role gallery and the amount of characters we haven't seen, I wouldn't mind not seeing the Joker anytime soon. I'm with you. Um, because there's just too much room for people to start comparing. Oh, we don't like it. And it's supposed it, you know, if the Joker doesn't work, does it mean the Batman movie, whichever, jo whichever uh, movie, uh, uh, he's supposed to be showing up in the second one, apparently, from what I've heard. Or at least yeah. referenced. I don't know if he's physically in it. I guess okay. a, he will be referenced. But yeah. I'm, I want them to slow play it as well. I wouldn't yeah. mind if he's not in it until three or four. Yeah. I mean, imagine we really get like a, a really good Mr. Freeze. You know, exactly. I would love to see that character. Mr. Freeze was dope, especially in the animated series. It's like you felt for the guy. Um, so there's so many possibilities that they can go with in terms of world galleries. There's so many storylines that they can go with that doesn't necessarily have to involve the Joker, the Joker or have him be the main attraction of that film. So if he doesn't show up for two, three films, if he doesn't show up at all, listen, I've always said that this movie could spark something outside of, um, this Batman universe that Matt Reeves is is starting, or is you know this this movie that he's 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 putting out, because again we have seen 
um, people in costume, you know, although, you know, like playful costumes of Superman, Wonder Woman and stuff like that, that, that tells you something. And so who knows? Um, and something that we'll get, we'll talk about a little later in terms of how, you know, they want to approach this DC universe. Let's see. All we, all we can do is is, is, is is wait and see what they do. But again, I don't need to see the Joker anytime soon, man. And and now that they're talking about Joaquin Phoenix and Todd Phillips going back to the drawing, not, doing, not back to the drawing board, but going for a second film is like, come on. So let us know what you guys think in the comment section below about Colin Farrell's performance uh, or his appearance being limited to just nine minutes. And do you think he'll probably show up in subsequent films? By the way, if you listen to our show and um, are driving, you can sure go to the iTunes. We have it. We have our podcast on that show on that channel too. So you can definitely listen to our show on iTunes and don't forget to hit that like and subscribe. Anyway, Moving on, James Gunn talks DC versus Marvel. Kevin Feige, he says, Kevin Feige may have m- maybe more involved with editing than Warner Brothers. You said this to me once before, Brian, um, that uh, James Gunn is, is being a little bit too talkative. And He's becoming a bit annoying with all this talk about the behind the scenes and how things get done and all this other stuff. And him talking about the idea of of DC and Marvel crossover, which are silly ideas, especially at this point, especially with all that's going on with Marvel without having to do anything with DC. So it's like, who cares is my point. Who cares if Kevin is involved in the the editing process of this? Because he was at the beginning of this, right? It was, this is something that he wanted to build and he's building it. There's a certain vision that he has. That's why he was, he was given the the CCO um, title. He's the man in charge. Why why are you even why is he even mentioning this? Brian, what do you think about his comment? Well, I mean, James Gunn is like that. Uh, I was trying to think of a good analog. He's like the you know, he's he's like the kid in your class who's like been to like the two places everyone wants to go but hasn't been yet. So like <laughs> everyone goes and asks them, Hey, what's it like there? Find, you know, like it, and he's the one kid, he's got all the inside scoop, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um and I, I, this headline, it couldn't, he hasn't really spoken as much since he made these comments initially. I feel like the headline spun this as like a pro Warner Brothers anti Marvel. And I don't even know that he meant it that way, to be honest. I, mm-hmm. Like, let, let's break it down from a couple levels. Number one is, of course, the parliament's more involved. They had a single unified vision for the MCU from inception. You don't think they're going to yeah. be involved? Like, of course they are. That, If anything, like I could spin that and say Warner Brothers should have been more involved, but the issue is how they're involved. Yeah. That's been the complaint, right? It's like, you know, and Marvel's involvement has had pitfalls, right? But I would say, by and lo- we talked about the endings to the TV show. Sometimes felt like Marvel was kind of slapping the formula on the end of WandaVision. And sometimes tonally in the initial movies, it felt like the filmmakers were being forced to conform. Uh, maybe like an Edgar Wright, most notably, leaving Ant-Man. But mm-hmm. I think the baseline positive is that Kevin Feige, the Parliament, and Marvel had a generally very good understanding of their characters and how to translate them from pages to screens. And they were going to make sure that the filmmakers they hired were kind of on board with that. That is not a bad thing, especially in a first-generation attempt to bring this to life. Let me read you an excerpt from this article. 
And if you want to read the articles in the description below. There's no doubt Kevin Feige is way more involved with editing than people are at Warner Brothers. He gives more notes. You don't have to take them, and I don't always take them. Then again, I had more problems. If you saw the first cut of Guardians 1, which I thought was great, it had more problems because that was my first time making something so gigantic, and there's something, there's some learning to what works and what doesn't, carving away the excess stuff. The truth is, as Marvel goes on and Kevin Feige starts to amass ownership of all, of half of all film in general, he's more spread out. And this this one comment is like bothers me. That is, uh, and I quote, "That is one of the ways in which DC can distinguish itself from Marvel." I think the current batch of folks over at Warner Brothers are really interested in building out a world and creating something that's unique to filmmakers. That's what I have a problem with. When strange times or anything can happen, I do find because of the ability to do different stuff in the DC multiverse, it's fun. They're starting to really resemble their comic books. The Marvel Universe has always been a little more cohesive and DC has always had more great single runs. How do I say this? DC, if they continue down the path of giving freedom to filmmakers to do whatever they want, they will never be able to compete with Marvel because at the end of the day, it's business and it's money. When you look over to the other side and you see all the money that they're making, you can't tell me you don't want some of that success. Granted, you're going to get your single films like The Joker, Aquaman, some of these other films that make a billion dollars, but it doesn't come around that often. With Marvel, most often. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you want a piece of that. You want to be able to have that same buzz and feeling and excitement. And when you listen, I was watching a YouTube video. It was one hour long and it was all fan reactions from beginning to end of that film so they just highlighted um, um um different pieces of that film end game and the crowd reactions that you got is for yo know, with dc you don't get that so and we'll talk about again we'll talk about this later dc's on another path man dc's on another path well maybe talk about that later maybe you think it's maybe man yeah, I think it's maybe. I think I think actually, look, this part of the, the this part of the thing just confirms something you and I have talked about before, which mm -hmm. is, yeah, look, the upside of DC is Joker. It's Dark Knight. It's every once in a, it's it's every once in a while you get the one filmmaker who who is able to connect with the audience in a mass market way, and you get a home run, yeah. but. It's just your range of outcomes is a lot wider and your consistency is a lot lower. I mean, now I'm not saying, like, is that a choice? Sure, you can make that choice. Yeah. Just understand that, like, you will also get Justice League. And I don't mean the Snyder Cut. You'll get Justice League, the theatrical cut. Like, that's how that happens, too. Like, yeah. you, and, you know, Marvel for all, you know, for, for its faults, again, if we go to, like, what is Marvel's bottom five? Two things about Marvel's bottom five. There's nothing nearly as bad as Justice League theatrical cut on there. And number two, bottom five all made money and <laughs> not a small amount of it. So we can complain about Ragnarok. We can complain about Iron Man 3. You know who's not complaining? Disney. Because no. <laughs> they made money on those. Shazam so, critically acclaimed. Shazam was critically acclaimed and made what? 300, 300 mil? Yeah, and I think the I think the issue with that is that's a good example because I feel like Shazam. If we were to compare Shazam to like Ant Man, for example, when you build brand that is associated with consistency and success, you get the benefit of the doubt for the marginal project when you swing at something. More people are likely to kind of say like, "Well, Marvel's done right by me for 10, 12, 15 projects." I don't really get this one, but it's Marvel. Can't be bad. I'll go see it. When you don't have that cachet, Shazam loses some of that audience because nobody knows it. Nobody identifies with it. So even if it's good, people are like, yeah, but 
there's no buzz around the universe. Like I do, I do think that matter. I think like if if Shazam was a Marvel property, I think the box office probably would have been a hundred or two hundred million dollars higher just yeah. because of all the other stuff that was viewed as good. Exactly. Before we move on, do you think? Uh, I'm curious. Do you think Quantum Mania, Ant Man, Quantum Mania, does a bill? Huh. Uh given what has that's a big fire i know you're i know you, you you're saying basically can jonathan majors make this a billion dollar movie that's effectively what you're asking yeah. um and we'll see who else shows up in it that's a big leap uh i'm more comfortable at 750 which would be a big jump from the 500 ish they've been sort of living at for the and yeah. it's not gonna I, I mean the budget for that movie is not gonna be like 250 million dollars it's gonna yeah. probably be like 125 150 so 750 is gonna be a real nice chunk of change for them but, but yeah um, but it will definitely be did you expect captain, captain marvel to make a bill do you do you think did you expect captain marvel to make a bill I did actually. Really? I, I did. Just I, I, because I, I, I maintain that they could have put anything in that spot ahead of Endgame. Because it was before, yeah. Yeah, I actually did. Even though I saw it, it was like this is not that great. I was like, but, it doesn't. Matter. But yeah. that begs to to question the 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 thinking behind it is Quantum Mania, Doctor Strange, so all these things are connected. Everybody's gonna want to see that connectivity what leads to what, why, all this other stuff, all these questions that you may have, th these movies sort of, you know, rely on each other for that storytelling and you're going to want to see what it's all about. And I, I just think a billion dollars is not, uh, is not so uh, out of reach um, pending what's going on in the world, right? So um, let's move on. Go ahead. I, I, do, I do one last point on this point, mm -hmm. which is, and we'll talk about it more in context of the merger. Um, I think part of the struggle too is if you're WB and you're DC, if you're going to choose the completely hands-off route because you don't necessarily feel like you're close to the genre or close to the characters and you just want to entrust the filmmakers. Again, I think there's some validity to that, but then I feel like you should lean into that. And I kind of feel like what they're doing with Flashpoint as far as like resetting this multiverse almost does a disservice to that. You're kind of saying, well, we want to give freedom, but we want to connect everything as well. And that's where I think some of the confusion might come in. It almost feels like if you really want independence and multiple versions of the same character and you just want different artist visions up on screen then do that but do only that like become only that like i feel like if you're gonna have a shared universe and you're it, it'd be like you know let's say batman does becomes this huge trilogy and then all of a sudden in batman 3 they're like you know what um joaquin phoenix is now the joker and we're just gonna retcon Todd Phillips' world with Matt Reeves' world. It's like, mm -hmm. wait, what? Like, I, I, <laughs> I'm totally fine with that idea if I know that it's possible along the way. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, if you're going to tell me, wait a minute, Todd Phillips had a young Batman, but that's not our Pats, or is it? Like, you know what I mean? That's where it gets a yeah, little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you're kind of trying to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. And I don't know that DC and Warner Brothers actually know for sure which of these routes they ultimately want to um, be in and especially with the merger which i think is really going to shake up anything james gunn is talking about right now out of all those things that they want in terms of letting the filmmakers do what they want or whatever and they, at the same time they want success man they want success and what does success look like take a look at those guys over there yeah. that is success my friend anyway um, speaking of James Gunn, we get first reactions for the Suicide Squad, and they seem, not seem, they are very positive. Um, it seems like the, the, the people that have seen it are very, were very, you know, um, um, excited about what they saw. They had a lot of fun watching it. Um, 
and this could be it's, this could be a very very successful film for um warner brothers although this movie will be released on hbo max for free correct so we're not well, going yeah, to be able to well you mean if you subscribe there's no additional yeah, yeah yeah right so we're not going to be able to see the true box office potential of this film because of it yeah no i'm glad i mean i'm, I'm excited i think I think dating back to when we saw that first featurette, my interest went from zero to, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Might yeah. have found something here. Yeah. And I feel like the trailers, like I said, have been very true to the spirit of what I understand the Suicide Squad characters to be. Mm -hmm. And so I feel it feels like the reactions are bearing that out. That he kind of has harnessed, you know, the the essence of of this of these these characters which i think is great because it does it does i think it also will underscore like if this doesn't work then i would kind of say like these characters probably don't really work on you know the big big screen setup so uh, but i'm excited to see it i mean i think it's i think it's it's looked good the trailers have looked good and so the reactions are saying that you know he's he's doing his his james gunness which is you know <laughs> been been pretty entertaining i mean i have all that we can we can critique his his uh his loose lips on social media and in interviews but i mean yeah i mean his, his stuff's been pretty entertaining so i'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this so i won't be going so here's a question though mm -hmm. you know you have hbo max i have hbo max are you going to the theater to see no. this? okay yeah. so there's a interesting because it kind of looks like a big screen it type does of movie, right it does but from what i've seen in the trailers and some of the humor that they've tried to interject um, I'm not really too doesn't tickle my funny bone, you know, in terms of the humor that they're introducing in there. Um, it looks good. That feature it definitely made me more excited, but as I've seen it more and more, I don't know. I, I, I'm not looking forward to that to 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 the film that much to want to go to the theaters to go see it. Is what I'll say. Okay. Are you gonna go? I think I might. I'm kind of in this kick of I've missed the movies so much that now that I've gone back a few times, I'm I'm ready to go. Um, I'm gonna go see Snake Eyes in the theater. I definitely want to see that. Yeah. So you know, I'm just sort of in that mode of like, give me a movie somewhat in the genre that we like, and I, I'm gonna go pay to go see it because I know the theaters are pretty empty at least where yeah, I am and. Yeah. And that's kind of a relaxed experience, and it just feels nice to be yeah. watching them again. So. The only thing that bothered me about the most recent trailer, which was the last trailer that they put out, um, was they say the line, call me Storm Shadow. I'm like, why do they have to do that all the time? Yo? <laughs> call me Black Manta, call me Sub Zero. Call, you know what I'm saying? It's like, don't do that. Your old time is like, it's just, it's just sort of like corny. It's corny. Um, next up. And do you guys agree with that? Like call me, uh, I call me storm. I like storm shadow. Storm shadow was dope, but th that call me storm shadow was like, comes out of like nowhere. Like you, you don't talk like that in real life. <laughs> you could call me Bob. <laughs> only, uh, only, only Ishmael, all right? And Bobby Dick. That's it. Yeah. Um. Next up, Man of Steel producer believes multiple Superman projects can be, or can coexist. Now, this goes back to some of the things you said um, recently regarding, you know, having this universe where it can become quite confusing. Are they a multiverse or they the same universe or these standalone? Um, we already know that J.J. Abram and uh, Taka, Takahani Coates, Tanahasi Coates, yeah. Tanahasi Coates is um, writing um, and J.J. is producing a Superman film. What it will be, we've definitely spoken about it. If you want to, you can check that, that, that YouTube video out. Um, we'll talk about Henry Cavill's um, Superman that may not um, come to fruition um, based on some recent news. But what are your thoughts on a producer saying that multiple Superman projects can coexist? What are your thoughts on that? 
So he he's ref- so Charles Roven, who was the producer on the Dark Knight trilogy and sort of the Snyderverse movies, he's specifically referring to the Henry Cavill Superman and the J.J. Abrams Tanahasi Coast Superman because technically, you know, we we we've, we've had this before with television and movies, right? The Tom Welling was on screen and TV at the same time that Brandon Brandon Routh was Superman. Um, and most recently, we've had Superman and Lois kind of hit the small screen, even as Henry Cavill's still been playing mm-hmm. uh, Superman on the big screen. So he's speaking, I think, specifically to feature film Superman projects. You know, I mean, can I just state the obvious? It's like, mm-hmm. well, if they're both good, okay, <laughs> maybe. But you guys haven't really been good at making Superman good at all. So you know what doesn't work? Having who bad Superman projects up on the board? When you you know like, yeah, it just comes it comes down to quality. The thing I, I'm a little afraid of in this particular case, and I'll tread lightly here, is is obviously the, you know, if you have sort of the person of color and non person of color side by side, I'm a little worried that that becomes a thing. Um, it will if one of the projects is markedly better or worse than the other. Um, I'm afraid of that as a, a central part of the discussion, to be quite honest, for this particular one. I don't know what you think. Will it be a problem? I believe so. Especially if it's Clark Kent. Well, I don't think we... Uh, is this supposed to be Clark Kent? JJ yeah, Abrams? well, they said it's... Okay. Cal- well, they said it's Kal-El, so unless you're going to rename Kal-El's alter yeah. ego, then... It's going to be a problem. Should it be a problem? Not really, but I can understand why people may have a problem with it. I certainly have a problem with it. Um, and it was something crazy. I saw something about another character being um, portrayed by a person of color. And I, for some reason, I started thinking about back in the day, and you had mentioned this before, back in the day, that's what they drew was white people, you know? And we grew up with that. Um, but the whole Clark Kent, fine, he's an alien, but are they going to like him because he's not, because he's an alien, Right. Is it going to be a Briggerton sort of situation where you don't care, right? Everybody is black or white is is rich, and they there are other issues that they talk about that doesn't that 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 doesn't really matter. I don't know, but I, I certainly think it'll be a problem. People are going to be talking about that will be the main focus, and that shouldn't be the main focus of of, of this. And and that's why I have a problem because they're. I, they're putting it out there. Just, I don't know, to be different, to, 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 to make Superman pop. I don't know why, why they're doing this. I don't think we've had, we've gotten a full conversation with them talking about of why they're doing it this way and why they're going this route. Oh, I don't think you're going to get that though, to be quite honest. But, you know, I, I think part of the problem too is, is when you talk about multiple versions of the same character, I think a lot of that also depends on, you know, what is the setting? Uh, what, what's, what comics are you looking to adapt? Like I, like I would put in front of you an obvious one is like, if we did a, you know, a Matt Reeves Batman, and then we had a separate Batman beyond, I think that's fine, right? You're talking mm-hmm. about almost two different genres, yeah. very different age, yeah. Bruce Wayne, different Gotham. Yeah. I think Superman, it's like, if you were going to do something similar, it's like, maybe it's, you know, a Superman in space, right? We, I've talked about exile, but like a Superman that's off world versus the origin Smallville metropolis, like maybe that can work. But if you're Mm going to put like Cavill in his earlier years as Superman, which is kind of where we left him. And then you're going to kind of have Tanahasi coach JJ Abrams origin of superman but in the 1960s or 1930s or wherever because the period piece remember so wherever they're going to put him now i think you're running into more problems where it's like it's really a parallel run of the exact same character but you've just you know you change the 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 year and maybe in this case you've also changed the ethnicity of of the of the lead so 
I think if you're going to do these, you have to kind of choose lanes that are distinct, that make it feel distinct. And I think in some ways, you know, we haven't talked a lot about Superman and Lois, and I've not been a devoted watcher of it. But I will say that the, the bit that I did watch, which wasn't bad, mm -hmm. the lane they found was this idea of Superman as a dad. Yeah, yeah. I know that sounds hokey, <laughs> but it was, it kind of works like Superman facing issues, not just as a superhero, but as trying to raise kids, one of whom is, spoiler alert, one of whom is super powered and one of whom is not, gave the show at least a little bit of a nuance. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, I haven't watched it and I've heard good things about it too. I just haven't, I don't well, want to watch- you're CW'd out. You're yeah, CW'd yeah. out, that's the problem. Oh my God, Brian. Did you see, I don't know if it was the latest episode, but I saw a clip of, this sort of Star Wars-esque Flash and some other Flash fighting another speedster with a light, <laughs> it, with, oh, it looks like they're fighting with um, lightsaber, lightsabers. It is <laughs> ridiculous. Maybe that's why all the cast members are dropping out of that show. <laughs> I'm so glad I tapped out when I did. Because this this is, I hope he finds a job. Gus, Grant Gustin, I hope after this he finds a job and some other people there, I hope they're, they're, they're working towards something because. Are we sure he's not in Flashpoint? They did the crossover on TV. Sure. Barry Allen showed up. Maybe. Are we sure he doesn't cameo in Flashpoint? Uh, maybe, but I hope he finds more work other than the Flash. Because uh, this, is, this is just getting ridiculous. Um, anyway. Let's move on. Yeah. DC movies to be set up to be set up like Marvel Studios after Warner Brothers and Discovery merger reports. Let me read an excerpt here. Um, according to a report by Newsbreak, after the merger of Warner Brothers and Discovery, the AT&T CEO John Stanky and Sashloff spoke at length about their plans for the future of the DC film franchise. David Sasloff stated that his number one priority will be building relationships with the creative community and that he also plans to spend time in Los Angeles, New York, and anywhere in the world where talent is based to seek out the best creative culture. The mega deal that took place in May this year will unite Warner Brothers and Discovery's collection of streaming and cable channels. There was another uh, thing that I found interesting. It is also being reported that with David Sasloff in charge, the company's approach to movie making and DC films could shift as he is known for turning over management teams and shifting strategic gears get quickly when results are not to his liking. This is something that we have spoken about previously when it was first announced. <laughs> this was like two months ago we talked about this or whenever it was announced, we, saw, we talked about it. And this is exactly what we were uh, um, predicting, sort of. Um, the pandemic led the pandemic led to Warner Brothers' decision making of releasing each of his. Yeah, 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 there was something else regarding what they were um, attempting to do with, um, in terms of being similar to how Marvel makes his movies. They weren't thinking about um, adopting the same creative process. But certainly what they are looking towards is having someone in charge of this. God, I hope is Bruce, is Bruce Tim. I'm praying that is someone like or is Bruce Tim. Brian, what were your thoughts on this? This is very similar to what we had discussed previously. And um, it finally came out. Yeah, well. Cue, cue the clip of Pablo saying, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> is this what this is? Like, when this merger was announced and you look, all you, just Google David Zasloff. He has a Wikipedia page. You can look at his resume. You can look at where he's worked. And it's like, he's a classic media mogul. It's like, they surround themselves with their people. That's what they do. It's a savage business. It's a backstabbing yeah. business. It's what it mm -hmm. is. Like, just 
these guys all wind up being working together. They wind up being rivals. He's coming in to clean house. This is why the James Gunn comment previously about like all the DC folks and what they want to do. I'm like, yeah, that's great. I don't think most of them are going to be there in 12 months from now. Mm -hmm. Maybe some will, but if they don't play ball with the new regime, they won't. Yeah. So as you've said, this whole thing of it's about business. Yeah. David Zaslav doesn't come in with allegiances to Walter Hamada or, you know, Kobe Emmerich with, even though he's friends with them, he doesn't have any allegiances to the Casey boys. He doesn't care. He cares about making money, making shareholder returns. Mm -hmm. And part of that is he needs DC to work. Like it has <laughs> to work consistently. So he's just looking at he's just looking at the board and saying, "What's the best model that's out there? What can we learn from it?" Yeah, I actually disagree with you on the Bruce Tim thing. I think Bruce Tim should be I think Bruce Tim should be one of the DC Parliament, and I think the head of DC, as I've predicted, will be somebody on the existing Marvel Parliament. It will not be Kevin. Ah, yes, I remember I, my prediction that, yes. remains they mm -hmm. will throw a godlike Godfather <laughs> offer at one of the other parliament members, I think there's four or five main ones. I think they've said there's 15 people total, but if you look at the movie credits, I think there's five total that are listed. I think it's going to be one of those people mm -hmm. under Kevin who winds mm -hmm. up running this show and gets offered too much money to say no. And Bruce Tim might become that sort of executive creative voice in the room mm -hmm. but he doesn't really have to get his hands dirty in the way that kevin foggy does with every every project right now for marvel that's my prediction this article made me feel even more like yeah zaslav's a practical guy yeah, yeah, yeah. he's just coming in looking at it as what makes sense and i think that's going to apply to every person in management I think it's going to apply to every project in the pipeline. They're just going to re-review everything and be like, is this working? Does it have an audience? Great. We'll go with it. Is it shaky? Do we not have a real plan? Do we not have a real vision? Cut. I think yeah. it's going to be that simple. I'm, and we're going to see what happens. I think it's going to be someone like Bruce Tim. I think it's not going to be anyone from that side. The reason why is because they're not looking to adopt that sort of same creative culture that they have over at Marvel based on the article that I read. Um, but they're looking, they are looking to have a figurehead, someone like a Kevin Feige run the spot. And if it's someone from that side, they're going to run the spot the way it's been run because it's worked. Right. So there's going to be, if that is the case, if they do want somebody from that side, they're going to have to compromise on how they want to work in order to make this money at the end of the yeah. day. But so, I think, like, I think mm -hmm. the people on the parliament, there's not one person on the parliament that would have made every single same decision that Kevin made. I think yeah. they all, right? It, it's a collaboration, which means I think if you give that person rope, they're going to want to do it a little differently. They're going to say, like, look, here's the things that I think work about Marvel. Here's yeah, the yeah. things that I personally think I could improve. I think that's the DNA of how this gets done. Yeah. So I, that's why, but the money's going to be there because it, there's, there's so, put it this way. There's no amount of money you could offer up front to this person that is too much. Because mm -hmm. if it works, the amount of money you make on the back end makes it's that person a yeah. steal. Yeah. Let us know what you guys think. What's going to happen with the DC Universe going forward? Because this we're going to hear some huge announcements in the next two to three months. Before the end of the year, we're going to hear some huge announcements perhaps some cancellations, perhaps some new announcements of new films, some new hirings. We'll definitely get that. And um, let us know what you guys think about the DC universe going forward. Next up, Batgirl casts Leslie Grace. Um, you already heard me say this, um, and I'll say it again. You want to do Batgirl? Because I, I believe the people that did, um, I forget their names, they they did um, Bad Boy. And Bad Boy's for Life. Yeah, yeah, and it was a huge success. Everyone seemed to have enjoyed it. I still haven't seen the film. Not because I don't want to, it's just I haven't gotten around to it. But I definitely want to see it. Um, I'm just not into characters where the aura and the presence of Batman isn't felt in some way, 
somehow. If this is an origin film, there's no way you can tell this story without Batman. Some way, somehow. If those elements are missing, I am out. Brian, your thoughts? Yeah, agreed. I mean, I think our, our, our steam for this show is pretty low. I'm in the same camp as you. Um, I would also point out Barbara Gordon is being introduced on Titans in a couple of weeks, or at least their version of her. So multiple Barbara Gordons apparently <laughs> coming. I'm not sure that's the character that I would necessarily want multiple. I, mean, I don't know if we need multiple versions of Barbara Gordon up on screen at the same time. But um, as you pointed out, it you know, it seems like this is one that's being fast tracked a little bit. I don't totally know why. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm actually more curious about the Emerald Fennel Zatanna than I am about this. Um, but, you know, like I said, I also think on the HBO Max side and ahead of the merger close, I do think there's a lot of trying to get stuff going and get stuff up on the screen and just kind of experimenting with what's going to hit. I personally don't think this will be a big hit unless it's like surprisingly critically acclaimed. Yeah. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe I'll be wrong, but, you know, maybe it's one I'll check out the pilot of, but yeah, I'm not coming into it. With Is it supposed the same to be a show screen. or a movie? I don't know that we totally know the structure of it yet. I believe it's a movie. Okay. But again, whether it's a movie, a show, a short, if Batman is not involved, I am out. In some way, some in some fashion. If he's not involved, I am out. Uh, are you guys excited to see Batgirl? Let us know in the comment section below. And, and I don't want people to think that, oh, because she's a girl, you don't want... No, it's not, it has nothing to do with that has nothing to do with that. I enjoyed Black Widow. I like Black Widow. It had its faults, yes, but I enjoyed watching it. I'll probably watch it again once it gets on it on a Disney Plus for free. I'm not going to pay for it again, but I enjoyed it. Um, but it's all about that storytelling for me, man. It's all about the, the, the why and how and all this other stuff. And that's what, for me, makes a good film and a good a show if they have, if they, if they get to do one. Next up... Zack Snyder's Stone Quarry Productions signs first look film deal with Netflix. Did we not talk about this? A long time ago when the, the Army of the Dead situations began, we said, don't be surprised. <laughs> I think I think I named the, the name of the, I think I named the, the YouTube video I'm taking my talents to Netflix. I think that was the, the, the title of our video. <laughs> and here it is. We said this months ago. And what's interesting about this article, this comes to us from the Hollywood Reporter. Again, I'll leave the, the link in the description. Is what Deborah Snyder had to say about all of this. As he says, I quote, and I quote, for us, it was so important to find a partnership that was based on mutual respect. The creative process works best when everybody trusts each other and you can take chances and be creative. For us, we don't usually play it safe. And we know this about Zach. The content we make is a little bit edgier. Sure, we, 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 we know this. And I think it's important to have a good partnership and hear each other out. She also adds, and Netflix has given us the, a lot of freedom, but they've also embraced the idea of trying new things and not necessary waiting, not, and not necessary waiting for a success before moving uh, ahead. A consumer isn't going to be waiting two years for more. And that is exciting. I give them a lot of credit for developing that partnership and trust. Okay. So obviously she, <laughs> she, she, uh, takes a dig at Warner brothers. Right. And, and listen, a whole flock of Zack Snyder fans are going to 
are happy to see Zack Snyder's visions on whatever it is that he does. Let me just reiterate, Snyderverse is dead with regards to Justice League as over. Now you got some other stuff to look forward to. Forget about Justice League. That's not his, that was not with, that's not his thing. That's not his thing. He wanted to do something different. He did it. It's over with. Now he's moving on and doing some other stuff that I'm pretty sure a lot of us are going to enjoy, are going to look forward to seeing. But this is something that we spoke about um, well, quite some time ago. Brian, were you surprised at this announcement? No, not at all. So first of all, Deborah Snyder putting on the Wonder Woman suit and replaying the scene in Snyder Cut where she's tossing around all the bad terrorists. That's Warner <laughs> Brother executives being flung <laughs> against the wall in those quotes because those are thinly veiled yeah. shots, man. Oh, yeah. Those are really pointed. Um, look, this is the only way this was going to go. I mean, I think as we discussed many times, I, you know, I think there, there is a camp of people inside WB who actually would have wanted to go back to the well. I, I don't, I, I believe that. I believe that there are people maybe on the HBO Max side in particular who would have wanted to see more, but they weren't going to sign up for that ordeal again. They had a miserable time. Like, yeah. I mean, it was very obvious from start to very early on in the process to the very end that this was not fun for them. And, yeah. you know, there's big money for them elsewhere and creative freedom. And as we talked about in our prior show, he's tailor, I mean, he is tailor made for Netflix's designs on being more of a platform for bigger event films. He is perfect. Yeah, they think yeah. they said the other day, 75 million people watched Army of the Dead. So not necessarily their highest performing film, but in the top 10 that they've mm -hmm. ever produced. Mm -hmm. You know, Rebel Moon, we talked, I mean, it's great. It's it's they can give him a lot of money. He can do exactly, exactly what he wants. He's known for doing. The fans get what they want. He gets what he wants. Netflix gets what it wants. And you know what? You and I are much more likely to consume his product as Netflix subscribers than we are sitting there kind of saying, "All right, am I going to spend to go to the theater for this versus that?" No, we're going to probably watch almost everything he puts out yeah. on Netflix at some point. So yeah. this is a win-win, and I think if you're a fan of Zack Snyder, like get past the DC part and just be happy for them yeah. that they found a home where they could actually create the kind of stuff that if you became a fan of his in the first place, you're going to get a lot more of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. Again, Zach is in heaven right now. And uh, this leads into, you know, Netflix making yet another move. Uh, I've, I know you guys have recently heard that they're getting into the gaming situation, but they're also looking to increase the, the, the number of blockbuster films that they, they release. I think, what was the number? 70. They want to do 70 a year. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. That is, listen, a movie, new movie per. More than one a week. I, Big budget. I, yo, the streaming wars are, are, are like, it, it, it's, it's, I can't wait to hear the next announcement of Amazon or these other um streaming platforms making huge acquisitions of talent movie studios in order to compete with netflix netflix is is, is just trying to take over so here's what i don't get and it ties into this discussion mm -hmm. blockbuster filmmaking today is increasingly about the comic book and superhero genre netflix doesn't really own the ip for any of the leading sort of comic book out there there's no they can't do marvel they can't do dc um you know umbrella academy is a tv show they dabbled obviously with mark they're doing some mark millar right that's clearly one of the things they're working on but like what is out there for them to acquire in this genre because i just don't see how you could get to a full-scale 70 200 million dollar type budgeted movies in a year without having the superhero genre be at least a part of that? Well, 
what they do have possible options of is these lesser known uh, comic book uh, platforms or uh, IP, right? They can certainly adopt those. Um, and and obviously they don't necessarily all have to be superhero films and uh, I hope it's not because at some point, man, that fatigue is really going to set in, man. Especially not, not if, all. I didn't mean all. Yeah, I'm just saying, yeah, if you're yeah. doing seventy a year, I don't think yeah. it can be zero. Yeah. No. Definitely. Definitely. Um, again, they have they have options. I think they'll probably really look hard to find something that really works and can possibly be a franchise. I don't see why they can't do that. So they they they, they definitely have options. I don't think they're worried about that. But we'll see. I mean, Netflix is really laying it out there man and and disney amazon are, are looking at them like what you gonna do <laughs> you know what's your turn what you gonna do right that's how it looks like man because it's first you got amazon ryan johnson millions and millions of dollars right no well, was no, it netflix? On netflix so, so netflix. netflix what did amazon? The rings on amazon is the okay 500 million dollar um, one season <laughs> But there was also a bigger, uh, big announcement from Amazon. Didn't they acquire? Well, they acquired MGM Studios. Yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. So, and um, you know, Disney already has the heavy hitters with Marvel and Star Wars, and they're looking to just expand on that. So, Amazon and Netflix have to sort of try to compete with them. With regards to that, right? The only problem is that Disney has to probably a little, has to probably um, put them out a little bit faster. Well, uh, I thought of one, and I don't know what the, I don't know the legality. This is, don't mm-hmm. take this from a business standpoint, but what if Netflix made a run at Sony and to get a it, shared, to get Sony's share of the Spider Verse? But I think, isn't there some legal thing? If they sold it, they would lose. This- well, to me, I don't know the legality of it, but I also point out that you obviously Sony's the manufacturer of PlayStation and Netflix is getting into gaming. So like, I don't know if there's anything there, but like that to me is the most notable kind of high profile IP that's not really at a giant streaming yeah. home. It's sort of like the Sony verse of Sinister Six with Spider-Man. I don't know if they could get that fast, but... I mean, Sony has always been in talks for and there's always been rumored as a possibility of them being or their studio being sold to somebody or whatever the case may be. It's Apple, I believe I, at, at some point their name was thrown out there. But I believe that if they did sell, they, they would lose the Spider-Man um, IP. Okay. From what I understand, I'm not sure, certain of it, but I, I'd probably look it up if I were you. I'll, I'll probably look it up later to see if that is true, but I'm quite certain that is the case. Um, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think about 70 films per year, one, like one or two every week. That's crazy, yo. Blockbuster type quality films? That's, cr- yo, that is, I can't, it's crazy. It's crazy. And we talked about this when did we, we talked about this probably a year ago when we said, yo, the content is going to be crazy. The amount of content is going to be crazy. And we're just getting a whiff of what that's going to look like. That's just Netflix. That's just Netflix. Then we got Amazon and, and, and Apple. We don't know what they're going to do, but they they're like, they have money, but they're like, they're real quiet. They're real quiet. Um, last thing that we'll talk about in terms of the DC world, in terms of news that we've gotten, is uh, Momoa is going blonde. <laughs> this, you know what this is, Brian? I'm pretty sure. Well, I'm gonna guess that Warner Brothers wasn't even thinking about this. This is all Jason Momoa. Be like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dye my hair blonde. And they have to say yes. Why? Because I made a billion dollars for you. And you can't say anything to me. You're gonna you're gonna tell me no? You're gonna tell me no? Why he freaking puts he ha- he's throwing in the Marvel number and he's gonna hit dial. You're gonna tell me no? <laughs> <laughs> I 
this that's what that is, man. Momoa's doing whatever he wants. What do you? I mean, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? I mean, sure. I mean, it's comics accurate, obviously, but nothing about the way he's portrayed or looked has really been Arthur Curry comics accurate, and that's been fine. I actually don't have a problem with it. Yeah. Um, he probably can pull it off. I feel like he's had sort of highlights or you know kind of blondish streaks to his hair before but it also just feels like they're trying to get a little buzz going for the production now that they're underway it kind of feels like we're getting like a a tweet or an instagram or just something out of james wan or amber heard or momoa you know they're kind of starting to just kind of build get that engine going for for next year now that they're they're finally underway that's what this also felt like to me was like oh hey don't forget about us we're making a movie it's coming back you know that's because it's a crowded marketplace as yeah. we talked about so you got to make sure the buzz is there. So I think that's part of it too. But I agree with you. Like he, you know, there, he he's got a lot of <laughs> he's got a lot of power, a lot of power right now. So. Hell's yeah. So um, let us know what you guys think about him going blind. Actually, I was thinking about it. Yo, he could have been a dope uh, submariner if they if if this wasn't around for him. If Aquaman wasn't a, he could have been a dope submariner. You know, playing under Marvel's uh, rules or whatever. But yeah, let's get into part two of this Nerd Gen Report, where we're going to be discussing mostly the Marvel news that we've got. 